Okay, shall we get started? Um, right, so uh, my name is Carsten Rother. Um, I'm as Andrew Blake from Microsoft Research Cambridge. Um, so this will, I will give two lectures and um, so this is one and a half hours and there's another one and a half hour lecture. Um, so I will follow up, follow up on quite a lot of the topics Andrew Blake already kind of um, very briefly mentioned. Um, so my talk will be mainly about um, discrete models, um, optimization and, and a lot of different applications. So if you have any questions during the talk, um, I mean there will be some things which are quite fast. I mean you don't, I don't expect you to understand all of the details but, but if you have some fundamental questions or in general questions just like ask, interrupt me. We've got um, enough time. Okay, so the outline for the two lectures will be, um, I start with an introduction on, on random fields, then there is a lot about models used in computer vision. I go through a lot of the models recently and in the last five, eight years have been done computer vision using discrete, discrete models. Um, then there's basically, a, I will do start hopefully a bit of optimization techniques and I will, I will stop here and the second part of the lecture is optimization comparison and I think I should have time for another um, advanced section where I will actually talk about some improvements on uh, recent Kinect work we've done. Um, okay, um, introduction to random fields. So throughout the talk I will use the, uh, the following notation. So um, Z is an image um, given here. So it's RGB, um, three color channels n pixels, um, so in this case, I don't know, like uh, 6448 could be the size here. Um, the user has, for instance, indicated, gives scribbles here, uh, which is black, uh, uh, blue is for background and red is for foreground. And the goal is to determine um, for every pixel n a binary label if it's zero for background or one for foreground. So it's a, this is one of the most uh, simple or standard problems, computer vision. Um, and I will use that kind of like toy application or that application quite a lot uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, some of the aspects. Okay, so um, let's write down the probability here. So Z is given, um, X is unknown, so we can write down the posterior, which means given Z, what is the probability of the, um, of the labeling X? So it's known as the posterior, which is decomposed into a likelihood and a prior. So a prior only works on the unknown labeling X and the likelihood says if I were to know X, what, how likely is it that I really observed Z? And I will explain all of this here with some graphics in a, in, in a second, how we can build it for this very simple application here, how we can build likelihood and prior. There is another thing to make this a proper distribution, you need a called partition function P of Z, but very often people assume this is constant because it's like, what's the probability of observing an image? It's like every image is kind of like a, a possible, I mean every image we get in is a possible image, so this one can be, observe, can be seen as constant and then we get, uh, we can say this is um, um, equal up to um, just the likelihood and the prior. So, so then um, main, most parts of, the, of, the, of my two lectures will be about a maximum a posteriori of a map estimation. So the goal is you say for every, for every segmentation X you can evaluate the, uh, the posterior and you just say what is the optimal labeling X star which maximizes that, uh, that posterior. So this is the called maximum a posteriori or, or map solution. Okay, and I will, in the beginning of the talk, I will, I will then transform this problem here into a problem called energy minimization. So we simply say, we again go over all possible axes and we look at an energy and we simply minimize that energy. And I will make that conversion of how to come from, the, from a probability maximization to an energy minimization. It's, it's very straightforward to do. Okay, let's look at um, this example here. The user has given us some brush strokes. We could, for instance, um, so, so these blue ones are, like, are, the, are the dots here and the crosses, it's a bit hard to see, the crosses are for foreground brushes. Um, this is a slice through red and green. Um, now we could fix um, like a Gaussian mixture model. Uh, the blue is here for the, for the foreground and the red is for the, for the background. So these I think are, I don't know, probably eight Gaussians or ten. Um, so we could fit a Gaussian mixture model here. And with that Gaussian mixture model, you can exactly say, well, if I observe a certain color, it's say, I don't know, yellow, is it more likely to be foreground or background? 
So um, obviously the red and the, and the, and the uh, uh, purple colors here are more for the foreground and the dark ones are more for the background. So if we now say, let's look at the likelihood, if we say, assume I know it's, it's background, I look at this Gaussian mixture model, and for every pixel I see how close it to that, to that Gaussian mixture model, right? I see that the dark colors are more likely, so bright is a, is a higher uh, probability, are more likely uh, background, and dark colors are more likely foreground. Uh, so yeah, the other way around. So dark colors are not, are not background. And here you can evaluate foreground. We fitted this Gaussian mixture model, and then we see already a bit of the star, starfish shape appearing. So that's quite straightforward. And now we can say, OK, let's look every pixel independently. And that's called the maximum likelihood estimation. Um, every pixel, if we, if we were to have this probability, where uh, this posterior, where we just um, have a product over all of the individual likelihoods, we can then estimate the maximum likelihood by taking every pixel the optimal selection. And this gives you this image here, where you still see some holes in. OK, so how do we overcome these holes? Um, we introduce a prior. And the prior tries to encode something about the labeling. Um, it looks, it's, and this is the most simple prior, and we will look at a lot of different priors throughout this, uh, the, the, these two lectures. Um, so if you look ahead to um, a two neighboring pixels, um, xi and xj, then it's more likely that they have got the same label compared to having a different label. So if you look at the starfish, there are a lot of neighboring pixels here. They're both zero, they're both one, one, or they're zero, zero. There are some which travel the boundary, which some goes from one to zero. Um, but they are less likely. So we encode that as a, um, in this called like Ising prior. Um, it's there is an exponential minus and the difference of these two pixels. Um, so the bottom line is if they are the same, zero, zero, one, one, you get zero here. So exponential zero is one. Or if they're different, zero, one, or one, zero, it's, it's a 1 here, so it's exponential minus 1, which is 0 0.36. That means that the, uh, that the probability of having the same label is higher than having a different label. Okay? We, you will see in a second uh, why we have done this bit weird thing with exponential, but it bottom, uh, bottom line is simply you have, two zero, zero, you have two labels here, two labels here. You can have all these four combinations. There are only two possible outcomes, and one is more likely than the other one. Okay? Now, if you look at this, we could just write down this prior. Um, this is a proper distribution here with some partition function again. Um, this is simply the, the product over all of the possible uh, pairwise terms for all of the neighboring terms here. So this goes for all of the four connected, let's say four connected grid um, in an image. So all of these pixels are, all of these, uh, all of these, each pixel has got four possible neighbors and they're all connected with these terms here. And this is a fair sample from such a distribution here. So that means you see here that they are, they are quite often the same. They're, they're 1, 1 or 0, 0. But they are still, some of the pixels are also 0 and 1. So there's some transition with, um, with, uh, with the labeling. But, you, but observe that, like, obviously, the optimal labeling is everything black or everything white. Because this is like, if you, if you, maximize, if you, get, if you maximize this distribution here, then everything, everything zero, everything one, gives you the optimal value for this here. So this is, the, this is the optimal peak. And we will actually come to that later on. We will see that there are some problems uh, with it. But we also see that we need some likelihood. Otherwise, with just with a pure prior, we get these trivial solutions. OK, so now we can put all together. Um, this is uh, then the Gibbs energy. Um, so we write it down in this, in this following form using an energy. And I will come to then in a second to energy minimization, but you will see why I, in a second why I write an energy here. Um, so the energy is composed of these terms here, which are unary terms, which come from the likelihood. And the, uh, this means here, if we sum over these unary terms, they're just um, minus log um, probability of being foreground, and then you multiply it with xi's. So, so if this one here, if xi is 1, then this one here is active, the foreground. And if xi is 0, then this one here is active. OK, so we've got some term here which represents our likelihood. And that's called the uterine term. And we've got some term here which represent our pairwise term. And now you see there is an exponential minus of this thing here. So that's exactly the Ising prior which we had before. So it's exponential minus and this thing here, which is our, which is our, uh, um, which is, which is our uh, Ising prior. So, okay, now we have this so-called Gibbs energy. 
Um, and actually, yeah, so this is the, this is the uh, distribution here with some partition function. And now let's see that we can convert m taking the maximum of that called Gibbs distribution is the same as minimizing this energy. We will see that now. So we convert, we can take the minus log of that probability. And if you just take the minus log of this whole thing here, it's minus log of this, of this function here, um, plus and the minus log of, of this log of, and x cancel out, so minus is a plus. We just get this here. Now, since the, the, this partition function is independent of x, which we normally maximize over, um, so basically taking the maximum of that uh, posterior is the same as taking the minimum of that energy because the minus turns the max to a min and the log doesn't change anything about being a minimum. So this really says that uh, maximizing this posterior is the same as mis minimizing the energy and we can just talk about um, energy minimization. So we've got an energy here, we have an x and we minimize over that, that's an x star and this is the underlying energy. And now we see here, if we put the two things together, we've got that was the maximum likelihood. This here is switching on the prior and um, combining it in some way, and I will talk about this W in a second, uh, we, get, we get a much nicer result. It's cleaned up. So most of the pixels are both are 0, 0 or 1, 1, the neighboring ones, and it's also following a bit the, the likelihood, what the likelihood has, has told us. So now you could ask, well, what about the W? If the W is, uh, for instance, zero, um, we go back to the maximum likelihood. If W increases, um, then, we go, then we get results which are, which are more coherent. So, so what would be the result if, if W goes to infinity? Sorry? Will we? To the... Trivial solution, exactly, yes. And actually, I think if you, if you go more to the limits, it actually starts to be um, a bit more a circle because the, this is the minimum boundary length you can have. Like if, you, um, if this one has a longer boundary length, you cross more of these zero one terms and the, the more you increase it, it might get towards more like circular shape and then it will disappear. Okay. So one trivial way, and I will come to much more sophisticated in a second, one trivial way is to say, well, how could you choose this W? And one, one very trivial way is to say, well, I've got some training data, which I've got uh, here images, I've got tri-maps, and so the tri-maps say inside is definitely foreground, outside is definitely background, the gray area I have to um, get some segmentation, um, and there might be some ground truth labeling with it. Um, let's say we, we, just, we just pick a certain W, and when then we evaluate, then we run our, run our technique, we get some results, and now we compare in terms of pixels how many have been classified correctly, or how many are correct, how many are incorrect. And that's called, um, so measuring that is called a loss function, and, and the number of misclassified pixels is called the Hemming loss. So basically we try to optimize W under the Hemming loss. And so we could look at different W's and we can look at this, at this error and you see that it goes down and a certain W is a good value and then when you have a larger W it starts to, um, starts to increase. Okay? So actually in an exercise you will have a chance to play around with some of these settings um, and actually re-implement uh, some, some parts of this. Okay, MRS-CRF models in, in, in vision. So this is a very general overview. Um, so we talk about, we have different models. Um, they can live, they can be discrete or continuous variables. They can be discrete or continuous space. Um, there is dependencies between the variables we have to talk about. Um, mainly in this talk I will talk about discrete variables and discrete space and mainly about dependencies of these variables. But in the end, or in the end of the introduction, I also come to, um, to continuous variables and continuous space. Um, then there are a lot of application. I will go through quite a lot of them, how they are done with, with discrete models. Um, then the main part of the talk is about, or tomorrow's lecture is about um, optimization techniques. So find this, this map solution, and there is a, a large list of techniques, and I will go through quite a lot of them. And then there's learning, like how to learn, for instance, this W parameter. And um, I will actually now do a detour on learning because I think it's, it's, it's quite important and relevant. Um, so let's uh, do this now. 
and um, Christoph, Christoph Lampert will talk in, I think, in two or three days' time, and um, he will go through a lot of these concepts uh, again and, and explain them in a, in a proper way with equations, but here I already put some of the foundations of, 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 these, um, of, these, of this learning. So we actually, I mean, you've seen we introduced it with, a, with this probability, but in the end it came down to energy minimization. So you could wonder why did, did we talk at all about probability, right? We could just say, oh, there is an energy, let's minimize it. And, and Andrew said that was one of the uh, uh, key contributions like, like uh, 15 or 20 years back when people start to at least write down proper models and, and optimize it. And I think now is the time where a lot of like machine learning people come in where they say, well, okay, what you think about learning as well, right? Not only just, just optimization. Um, so let's talk a bit about learning. Um, so also, it just started like a year ago to look more in more detail in it, but I think it's quite, it's quite fascinating. Um, okay, so um, for a second, let's assume we have a distribution P of X given Z, comma W, and W is the, is the parameter which we want to learn, right? Which we have some training data, as I said before, with a frog, and we want to learn this, this, this W, and it can be many more parameters, not only this particular W, it could be a large number of parameters, and I will in the second half of the talk, I will talk about um, models where I've got 1.5 million parameters. Um, okay, so let's assume we were to have such a distribution which fits our training data, and I will come in, a, in, in, in five minutes to how do, we, how do we actually learn this, but let's assume we have that. And let's a bit talk about a bit decision theory about what, what to do when you have the distribution, what actually X star solution you should take when you have that distribution. Okay, so what it boils down to is what we want to minimize. We want to choose an X star which minimizes our expected loss. Um, so the expected loss is written with this equation here. So that means that the expected loss is the following. If we have X star as our final solution, is one solution we pick, we look at all possible other Xs and look how different they are. This is called the loss function. And then we, then we weight it with the probability of that certain solution. Okay, and we sum of all of these possible axes, and this is called the expected loss. And so the idea is really to choose, um, that's most general, and you will see that it makes a lot of sense to choose an X star which, is as, um, which, is, which minimizes this risk. The main question is what do we choose as loss function? And now we'll see in a second that different ways of, of making that decision really has an, has, depends on what loss function to choose. Okay, so. Um, I've got a question now to you. So let's assume we have this distribution P of X given Z comma W, and I've, I've made that up. I actually wanted to do that uh, properly with data, but I didn't have the time to do it. Um, so, um, so assume here the segmentation task is the following. Actually, the image, let's turn it into gray, which makes it much more ambiguous. So the, the units might be much more ambiguous, and there are these brush strokes. Let's just assume that we have X here is the space of all possible labelings. Okay, so each possible labeling of the of, of the outcome is a certain is a certain um, has has a space here and has a certain uh, posterior. Okay, um, and assume this is fixed here. Um, and now let's say okay these these ones for here are instances they are quite have a bit higher posterior and this one here actually happens to be um, a higher posterior than these ones here, but it happened to be a a, like a pretty bad solution. So this could happen if the unaries are quite ambiguous, then we actually, this one here is, an, is a not bad segmentation because it's very compact. So the transitions of zero to one are much l far less compared to this solution here. Okay? So what, if you have such a distribution here and you see this here, what's, what output X star would you, would you choose? Pardon? Depends on the loss function, yes. Yes. So, um, but yeah, so intuitively one said, well, it would be nice to choose one solution here, right? And now we see what, uh, we see what happens. So if we use the following loss function, which is called the, the image wide zero one loss, um, that really says, the loss, loss function says here, it's, um, it's zero loss if, if the x star which I choose is equal to x and one otherwise. So it's like a constant, otherwise a constant loss. So if you plug this in here, what we see is everybody pays a, a one apart from, the, apart from the right solution X star which we choose. 
That means to minimize the risk, you have to choose the solution which is the, which has the, which is the most likely one, right? So under this loss, it only cares about one solution, which is the right one, and the best one to pick is the, is the one which is the most likely. So if we have map, in this case, you would choose, you would choose this solution here, right? Which is, the, which is the map solution in this case. I mean, it could happen that this peak is slightly higher, and then you would choose a sensible one, but in this case, you would choose this solution. So I made it a bit more extreme, and the second comes actually a real, ap real application. Um, you could choose a different loss. You could say, well, what I really want actually is the Hemming loss. That means you, um, you choose, if you were to, with the Hemming loss, it might be that, um, that, or quite likely with this setup example, it might be this one here, that the, 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 the best X star. That means you take the, X, the, the right X star, compare it to all possible other Xs, see how similar they are in terms of pixel difference, Okay, and then you weight it with how likely they are. And see, there's a lot of mass in here, right? And therefore, it's quite likely you would choose this solution here because of all the mass here of these other pr uh, solutions, which are very similar in terms of um, segmentation and very high probability. You would choose much more, much more sensible um, solution here. So this is called maximum marginals. And um, so what you maximize here, actually, you compute the marginals, which I'll come to in a second. Um, and then you maximize, you maximize uh, for every pixel, you take the maximum marginal. Um, so here's now a real, uh, a real uh, world example, which is taken from the, from the recent book of um, Sebastian Novozin and Christoph Lampert. Um, so first of all, the marginal, marginal is really, um, the marginal is yet you pick for a certain pixel, you say, if it were to be labeled one, you sum over all possible other configurations where you only fix that particular labeling as one, for instance, and you sum over all possible other labelings. So that's called the marginal. And <coughs> so this is quite interesting here. So first of all, this here is, if you fix it to zero and one, it's kind of a distribution. So it's the posterior marginal distribution. And this is what we see here. If we, picks, if we fix every pixel here to, to zero, what is the probability? And then we see that these are the marginals. And if we take for every pixel, you can also compute the one for one. If we take for every pixel, is it more one, likely one or zero, we get this solution here. And you see here that the task was to detect the buildings. Uh, or it's, a, it's a building detector done by blocks. And you see here the solution is better than if you take the map solution. So the map solution would be this one here, where actually this one here is taken out. So this would be not part of the building. So you see by taking different loss function, you actually get a different uh, result in the end. Okay. Now, in something else, you could say is the uh, pixel square loss, which is if we don't have to have, we, we don't necessarily have uh, uh, binary labels. We could have, have multiple labels, and then it's just the um, the uh, the difference, the square difference about these these two um, observations, x and x star, and we get something called the MMSE estimate, uh, maximum uh, uh, minimum mean squared error, and it's actually weighting with the marginals all of the solutions, and you sum sum over that. Okay, so now I haven't talked about how do you get the probability, and this is, this is a very standard pipeline, and Christoph will go into quite length into detail about this pipeline and how exactly to optimize uh, this, this, this distribution P here. Um, so typically what you do is you have some training data, um, XN is some training glo uh, ground truth labeling, then the images, and then you have a maximum likelihood estimation where you really um, try to use, you have a product of all possible training examples, and then you maximize um, your posterior with respect to the W, and you might have some regularization on W as well. Okay, and so you maximize over, over W, and Christoph will go, I, I think, into quite length how, how to do these things. There are a lot of, it's a, it's a big problem how to do it with loopy graphs and so on. My main point was to say, if you've done this here, it really depends on the loss function, what, what then method you should choose in order to get out your best um, X star. Um, so it's a two-step procedure. You first try to do maximum likelihood estimation, and then you, and then you get your uh, decision out. So I've, we've done that in a, in a recent paper, um, for instance, for, um, on a quite very simple, um, simple graph. So that's for denoising. So you have some training images. There is some noise on. I hope you can see that there might be some bit of speckle noise on, it's pixel independent noise. And these are ground truth which, uh, with no noise. Um, and, and then we, have, we, used some, we used this maximum called actually pseudo likelihood learning um, for a four connected grid. 
and um, I will come in a second how the potential exactly look like. Um, so now you've got some test image and some, um, so this is the true test image, there's some noise and you might only see it on the horse here and they're zoomed in, so these are the end results. So this is really the map solution and this is the MMSE solution. And you see, oh right, this is, uh, this here, actually I can, I can hardly see it, but I think you see that this, this one here looks better than this one, right? In terms of uh, uh, results. So this one here has got, is kind of, kind of very uh, uh, blocky, there are like big errors with the same, same labeling. So this one is visually much, much better. Do you see that or? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so then you say, oh, okay, map is then not interesting, right? Because this is, this is a much nicer solution. I should always do um, uh, minimum mean squared error, okay? But there is an alternative pipeline, which is now quite interesting, uh, which also Crystal will talk in, in detail about, which says, well, we could take all the training data and now do, um, do, so this is the standard pipeline I just explained, so we have a two-step procedure, but there is this alternative pipeline called loss minim minimizing parameter learning, and it's just a one-step procedure. You have, you know, let's assume during test time, we say we, we want to use MAP during test time, okay? Now we've got the train data with the, with the ground of labeling and the images. Now we just run this one optimization where we say, well, give, us, give me the best parameters W so that they minimize, my, minimize the risk and um, get, yeah, so that they minimize the risk using map estimation. So you simply say, give me the best W and you could also regularize the, the, the Ws, put some regularization on, um, which minimizes the risk. And it's, so now we know, we basically plug in the, uh, the knowledge of, um, of, the, of the loss function directly into the learning because we, we say under this loss function, uh, yeah, under the loss function here, minimize directly the parameters. Okay, so Christoph will go into detail how, how this is done, but it's, um, it's kind of interesting. So now we, you, we do exactly the same family of models and we've learned the parameters differently and uh, I'll show you in a second how, what the parameters are, um, but here are the results. So if you use map now, suddenly it looks much, 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 much nicer and far less blocky as, as we've seen before. And um, obviously if we now plug in the, uh, the pixel squared loss, uh, so, so if we plug in MMSE, um, it doesn't make much sense because we really optimize it with map in mind. So it's actually quite interesting. We can compare now the different models which are learned so um, I will use similar uh, figures uh, later in the talk so we can explain them now a bit more detail. So this is the unary potential which um, simply says that um, we have an observation ZI which is a certain um, a color for, or gray value for that pixel. What is it different to the labeling we, we really obtain then in the end? And if they are the same we pay minimum energy and the more they deviate the higher energy we pay. And so you see now it's quite interesting that the, that the functions which are learned with the probabilistic engine uh, and the loss minimizing are quite different, right, in terms of structure. And it's, so it's no surprise if you use map for this one or for this one, they will produce different results. And this one was really designed to work best under map, right? Um, so the pairwise potentials here are the, are the difference of the two neighboring pixels of the final labeling. So what is preferred is that they have the same labeling but if they have different labeling, they start to pay a higher and higher penalty. But again, it's interesting that these kind of functions are slightly different um, when, you, when you learn them. Um, and so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. Actually, we see that, <coughs> and even we, we confirm that with numbers, that actually the, um, the loss minimizing a map gives better results than the probabilistic MMSE approach. Slightly better. Visually, I think, slightly better. If you look here, for instance, at the graphs here, there are more details up here visible, which is also in the true image, than down here. And actually, and I think there are some more studies in machine learning, um, you can show that if the, um, if the probability distribution is not really fitting the data well, and that we nearly always have in computer vision, I mean, our model never fits perfectly the data, um, then it's actually better to use this loss minimizing and map scheme compared to the standard uh, uh, probabilistic pipeline. Um, so actually we've done some, uh, some synthetic experiment where we looked at this where you kind of like deliberately constructed a model which deviates from the true model and the more it deviates the error 
um, um, is is much higher for for an um, for the um, um, probabilistic approach compared to the uh, loss minimizing approach. So let's summarize. So map is um, map estimation is important. Um, either sometimes you have systems where there are just a few parameters and we um, and and we can handcraft them or like choose them in some intuitive way. And a lot of I mean a lot of vision systems are built like that, right? And where we don't use any proper learning and so on. They're just like handcrafted. And then map is obviously very important. Um, <coughs> optimization general. Um, we could use, as I just said, loss, loss minimizing parameter learning or cross validation. Actually, just as a as an as a side comment, actually when you do that, and Christopher will talk about that, um, map estimation is um, is very important as part of the routine. You actually typically a routine for for op optimizing the parameters or finding the parameters is actually a constraint generation where each constraint is solving a map estimation and it's actually very important that you get global optimality of it if you don't get global optimality you get into quite a lot of trouble during learning and um, so therefore quite a lot of the talk will be about global optimality or getting good solutions and this is uh, so therefore it's quite important actually for for this part of the of the learning um, also one has to say that Uncertainty or, 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 or probabilities later on, as well as like marginals, are important if it's part of a bigger system. If you want to have your your model um, system built into a bigger system, it's good to have uncertainty. Um, as a side comment, there is actually a map-based uncertainty as well, which is called the uh, min marginals, where instead of before I had a sum here for computing the marginals, I could replace it with a max. And, and then you can actually also use efficient map solvers to get out these called uh, min marginals. Okay, I will, uh, that's kind of the stop of my learning section. Are there any questions on, on this? It was quite clear or? Yeah? Yeah, 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 I actually have, I've done that for instance. I've done, uh, uh, it's, it's getting, it's getting, it can get more tricky with, with different loss functions. But one thing I've done, for instance, was to say for interactive segmentation, what I really care about is how many brush strokes, how many user interactions do I need um, in order to get the ground truth, right? So I minimize the number of user interactions. And we've done, <coughs> we've done actually a max, uh, this, this uh, loss minimizing pipeline with that objective function in mind. It's got actually quite tricky because of exactly that issue that you don't get the map solution during a, during a step. But that's exactly what uh, I think one has, to, one has to do. So one has to really think about what is the right loss function, what do I really want to um, um, optimize in the end, and uh, yeah. Okay, let me just get a drink. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, to the main part, um, so we had this, uh, this overview here with models, um, application, inference, and um, optimization, and learning. So I very briefly introduce uh, what's very useful um, in, in, uh, when you describe energies or uh, probability distribution, they're called factor graphs. Um, so graphical models are a very popular tool in, in machine learning. There are various forms of how to, how to, do, how to write graphical models. There are undirected graphical models, uh, directed graphical models, undirected graphical models, and factor graphs. And um, for quite a lot of the vision problems, when you really deal with, in the end, with energies, factor graphs are the, are the most useful way of visualizing um, energies. Um, and I will explain one example in a second why, why that is. Um, okay, so factor graph is something very simple. Um, so let's assume we have this, uh, this Gibbs distribution here with, um, with these ones, uh, this is an energy with, with, um, with a factor here or like a function here which depends on three variables, one and, and two variables here, two variables here, two variables here. So we visualize it in the following way. We simply use for every um, variable here, we use um, an empty circle um, and put the labeling, uh, put the uh, variables in here, x1 to x5. Now we simply connect all of the variables which are in one factor or in one function here. We connect up and have a, have a square here. And that's like, um, yeah, that's, uh, so, so from this visualization here, you can very quickly 
see what is at least the structure of this energy. You don't know exactly the form of the factors, but you see very easily just visualize the structure of it. You see here there is um, so-called, I will come to that in a second, called triple clique or factor with three variables, um, error T3 and, and two here. Um, so again, here is the, here's the same. So what I will define as the order of, of a function in general of this energy, the order is the, is the error T or the number of variables of the largest factor. So this energy has, has, has order three because there's one factor with, with, um, with three variables in here. Um, so I will use actually factors and clique in, in the same way. I will not distinguish and that's not fully correct. Um, that's just as a side comment, like for instance, undirected graphical models. This is the undirected graphical model to this one here, to this factor graph. And um, you, one, one thing which is ambiguous with these undirected graphical models is how they exactly decompose into factors. So in an undirected graphical model, everything which is fully connected, like this here, this triangle here, and this here, this is fully connected, they form a so-called clique. But the clique could either be a true factor with three variables or it could decompose into pairwise. And this is ambiguous if you, have, if you write it as an undirected graph. So therefore the factor graph exactly tells you how the energy looks like. Um, so the nif definition of the order, I use the same for clique and factors. Um, so random field or Markov random field, so the Markov property, and that was Andrew Blake already um, hinted towards, is that, 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 the, um, that the random field has a low order, has low order factors. That it really isn't largely connected. There are not many um, higher order factors which have got, which connected to a lot of variables. We have most of the time pairwise or triple clique, some low order, um, low order factors. And that's called the Markov property. Um, that there is, that there is, um, they, the local dependency, it's, it's a local dependency, but you still have a kind of what Andrew called the knock-on effect. So this variable is still, is still can influence via the factors this variable down here, but it's only um, low connectivity and not everything is connected. It's not one big factor. Okay, so some examples of, of, of factor graphs, um, and I will go through a lot of applications using these different factor graphs. Um, so this is a, a four connected with um, order two, uh, so-called pairwise energy. Um, we've got just um, these factors here as four connected. We can have highly connected. This is an eight connected where a central pixel is connected with, with eight neighbors. Um, and then this is a higher order random field where there is like one, uh, one factor here which connects to all of the variables. Okay. Now let's look at some of the examples used in computer vision. Um, <coughs> We've seen already segmentation, so we now write it, uh, visualize actually slightly different. Also, Andrew has done that already with observed variables are uh, with, uh, with shaded, with shaded circles. So these are observed variables, and these are uh, uh, these are unobserved variables. And um, yeah, so this there are some unary unary factors, which are these ones here, which just connect to observed variables, and these are pairwise factors, which co uh, connect to unobserved variables. Um, and that was the segment, image segmentation example as a factor graph. Um, something which, um, which is very useful and called um, conditional random fields is, so conditional random field is, comes a bit more from discriminative models, but one thing um, what conditional random fields can do is like that all the factors can depend on the observation on the, on the, on the input image. And here, for instance, we have got one where the pairwise factor depends on the, on the image observation which is something very useful. And um, for a lot of applications, nearly all the applications can be division with discrete models, the pairwise or high order factors depend on the, on the data. Um, so here this, this function has the following form. If the two neighboring pixels have the same color, I have a higher penalty. If they have a different color, they have a, low, a lower energy. And uh, the reason is that this could be more likely an edge here, and this is less likely an edge for segmentation. So you see here that this is the result with, this, with a Markov random field where there's no, there's no con conditioning of the pairwise term. So this is a pure, pure Ising prior. And I think you can, hopefully you see a bit of black here. And this one here is a much better outline. Here follows exactly the boundaries here of the, of the segmentation. And this one is a contrast, so-called contrast sensitive term. And, and, the, and the data enters here. So this is the underlying factor graph, but it's not not overly exciting. Okay, let's look for instance at stereo. Um, 
So in stereo we can start, and I come to more sophisticated stereo methods, we could start with four connected grid. So we simply have um, <coughs> unary potentials all coming from likelihood, and I will explain that in a second. And then we've got uh, pairwise potentials, and I will explain that. So here for stereo, most of the time you assume that the images are rectified. Uh, that means that a scan line here corresponds exactly to a scan line here. That means to find the corresponding point here, you have to take one particular point, I don't know, let's take the tip on, on here, on the head, and find exactly on the same scan line, you have to find the corresponding one. If it's, if it's, if it's at infinity, in, at like f as far away as possible, then it's like the, uh, the shift towards the left is zero. So it's exactly the same position here on the, um, on the, on the, uh, on, on the vertical. Um, and if it's, the closer it is to the camera, the more it's shifted to the left. Um, and so these are called disparities or depth. So the, go the, the goal is to find um, the optimal, so we express this here as a multi-label energy with, uh, where D has got from zero to capital D, possible values, um, and every pixel has got, got one of these values. Now we have to define an energy which exactly encodes that good solutions have got a low energy and bad solutions have got high energy. Okay, so um, let's look at the unary term. Um, the unary term can for instance be done by um, by some square difference in the following sense. You, you, take your, you take your current pixel, you shift it by the disparity which you think it could be. So that's your unary term, you know what disparity you, you, you might expect. So you've got um, that's a unary term looks at the, at, the, at the possible labeling of that particular pixel and then you, re, you shift it by that amount and then you look at what is the underlying patch here and you simply make a difference between this patch here um, and then you can compute the sum of, the sum of absolute differences um, or sum of square differences of these two things here. I mean there are actually a lot of advances we just did this, this BMVC where we've got a quite nice uh, uh, paper coming up. I mean you first of all can use bilateral filtering weights or other weighting weights which are more sensible than just using the whole square. Actually we have there a paper which even looks at at finding a 3D orientation using some new method called patch match and it even on some of the approaches I show later with all of this propagation even outperforms some of that. So unary terms are actually quite powerful and it's worth to look into getting best unary terms. Um, okay so the pairwise terms here um, of that form and I will explain that now. Um, so one possible way of the, of the pairwise terms is to say this is, the, this is the difference in terms of a labeling of two neighboring pixels so it's a four connected. Um, if they are the same you pay zero cost and the higher you go the, the, the more the difference is the higher uh, cost you pay. And um, actually for this energy and there will come to that later, this is like because it's convex, um, you can actually get the global minimum and this is for the image which I showed before, this is the, the global minimum of that image and this is of another image, the minimum. But actually if you zoom in, you see these, um, you see these, see these effect that there's not a sharp uh, boundary between, the, between let's say the lamp and, and, and this part here. So does somebody know why there's not a sharp boundary? <coughs> Sorry? No? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so if you think about it, um, it's, it's cheaper, so if you have a big jump here, you would pay this high penalty. And it's actually cheaper to pay, I don't know, three times a smaller penalty than paying one big penalty. I mean, it depends on the cost function here. Sometimes people choose quadratic, for instance, and then it's even, even more. Well, thinking with a linear one, you, it might be that it's probably equivalent with, with the two, but if it's a quadratic function, it's, it's most of the time, um, it's, it's, uh, it's higher, it's, it's more to pay a big jump than a small jump. You rather do a lot of small jumps. So then the, that was the main um, idea behind, like, and, and Drew Blake did that in 83, and um, it's, uh, it's very um, fundamental to actually, um, to uh, computer vision, to have these kind of like robust potentials. You say, well, um, at a certain stage, I just want to, don't want to pay a more higher penalty, higher and higher, you say, you say pay a constant penalty. Um, but just actually, uh, just for interest, it's not true that for all of the functions you necessarily have a, have a, a, a um, this kind of truncation. I actually just uh, let me skip back even to this uh, to what we had here. Um, 
So that was here the energy which we learned after um, for, for, um, for, for doing denoising and it was really interesting. So what we learned here was actually this is exactly the same energy but now for denoising instead of uh, finding uh, depth information, right? So it's the same as like the di dj is now xi xj and it's kind of interesting because the, the, the w which I didn't really explain at that time, I should have done, um, is really every possible difference of these pixels is a, is a potential label, as a potential value, a W, and we learned that. So in this case we learned, um, no, no, there's 60 difference, so we had it symmetric, so we learned 60 possible values, and that was all done with uh, this loss minimizing learning, and actually it, it really surprised us as well that it really came out as an L1 norm, more or less, so it really uh, was a straight line, because a lot of people before I mean that was just very recent work I've done, always people think, said that there, there should be some truncation but surprisingly for the pairwise term for this particular application we didn't find any truncation really. So L1 is actually sometimes also a good norm. And funnily I mean for the, like here for the unary term there is actually a bit of uh, truncation in here. But that's just as a, as a side comment, I mean truncation makes sense for, for a lot of applications but when you really learn the energy it might not always be that, that truncation is the, is the right way to do it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so this one here, or yeah, any, so anyone. yeah, anyone. So it um, intuitively doesn't make much sense. The data said that, but one, one, the main thing to remember is you don't have much um, observations in this area. Basically, that means you choose um, you choose a very extreme value, which you rarely. Um, which you, which you rarely observe, observe in training. So in training we observe the x, the, the, the z and the x and if you were to make a histogram where most, where most of these differences happen, they're all in here. This is probably, I don't know, there are like in these millions of, millions of pixels, there are probably, I don't know, 100 or 200 which fall into this regime anyway. So it's very unstable and it just happened that, that, it, that it learned that. But, um, but these ones are not, these tails are not affecting the end result much. If you choose a different, you would get the same result, probably. Is that, was that clear or? Okay, let, um, okay. So now let's look at some um, <coughs> stereo matching and this is really comes down to speed as well. If you just have um, a pixel in the independent winner takes all, um, you might get such a result. But as I actually said, there's like the, we have this uh, BMBC paper where we actually really did the best in terms of patches and, and 3D orientation of the patch and actually get results which are state of the art for some of the images. So you can get with such things as well pretty good results. Uh, but this one here is a quite simple one where pixels are, is a quite simple technique to, you, to do it. Um, then when you have scan lines, that means you just, um, you just have a chain and uh, when I come to the optimization you will see that you can compute the global optimum for a chain. Um, you get such results here, which are often streaky because obviously the scan lines are con not connected. So you might, you compute for a scan line the optimal labeling, right? So these ones are uh, sensible smoothing and you get clearly an improvement over this one here, but you don't have any connections in the, uh, in the horizontal direction. This is then a result with a full connected grid and I come in, uh, in five minutes to one which is even more better results, which is more sophisticated than this. And this is some ground truth some pure student had to actually hand label this image, right? And nowadays we have a lot of uh, ground truth which I acquire from, from, from real setup on an optical table. You put some objects in and move them on a, on a, on a, on a, on a ray, you, on, on a, on a, on a, you move the cameras on a line and you have a, you have like a rig. And that's, but that was still done with labeling of a, of a poor student in, in Japan. Uh, okay, so another application where four connected is, is very useful is, is for instance texture synthesis. Um, so if you look at this, uh, this example here of, uh, of some text, um, this one here was created fully automatically from this one here. Um, and actually if you start to read it, I'm not sure if you, if you, are, uh, if you sit close enough, but actually you start to read some of the text, it doesn't make any sense. But I mean visually it's, it doesn't look that bad, right? So how is that done? Um, so, so how it's done is we take, we take this, uh, uh, this text here or this, uh, this example image here, and we now um, think about in 3D as taking this one and laying this one here, a shifted version on top, 
right? So we just simply make this one a bit wider in this direction. So we've got, we've got, we lay the two on top, and here this is the two on top. We have to find, we want to make this a big text, so we have to somewhere transition from this text to this, to the other text, right? From this image to the other image. The question is where do we transition? You can encode that as a binary problem where there's a zero for staying in, the, in, in, in this image and one for going to the other image, okay, from A to B. So where do we do that? We encode it as a binary problem of the following form. Um, we, we look at two neighboring pixels and we, we, we encode what is a good transition. So if, if it so happens that at, that I and at J, the two pixels have at the A and B have the same color, it's a good place to transition. Because if you just see this here, it doesn't matter what the labeling is, it always looks anyway the same. If it's 0, 0, or 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, it's like whatever labeling it is, it always is the same image, right? So you can easily transition at such a place. Where it is in this case, it's very hard to, it's, it's, you will see a transition. If you, if you have here the, um, the same colors, but here's a different color, if you have zero, 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 that means you stay in here, or you transition here, you would see it visible because there is a, there is a color transition, right, from going from zero to one. So we simply encode it in this, this following energy that we say the, at, at i and at j, we take the difference of these two pixels here, and if, and there are no unary terms, it's just this pairwise term, and um, we pay this penalty here, if there, if, if, the, if there is a transition. If for a transition from zero to one, we, we, this is one, otherwise it's zero, we pay this, this, this penalty, okay? So um, <coughs> this is how you get it, and this here is actually for, um, you can do the same for volume for a video. Let me just play that. So this here is a short video, um, and now the idea is to make a long video, and you simply can do the same trick, doing it in 3D. So you have got the short video as a video cube, right? And now you take the same, the same video and just shift it by some amount in the temporal direction. And now you say, um, find a, a, a 3D surface which, which labels, so every pixel has to be labeled 0 or 1. And where there's a 0 or 1 transition, it's exactly the same cost as I said before. And now the nice thing is you can get a new video which is longer and at every pixel here that might be at a different time a transition to the other video, right? And so try to find the best surface here. It's again, um, um, it's called, uh, uh, what was the name? Video, uh, video texture, I think, video texture. Um, and this is the approach and this is then the end result. So it's quite hard to see any transition really, right? It plays on forever. <laughs> no, it stops now. Okay, so the same actually can be used for um, for panoramic stitching. Um, so again, you've got uh, you've got here um, multiple images, um, and they're overlaid. You have already registered them with some interest point detection and and some homography alignment. Um, and now the goal is to find the labeling. In this case, it's no longer binary; it's multi-label, and um, and then you get, you get exactly the same energy, you can get this result out. Okay, so we've talked a lot about four connected MRFs, um, and so there are a lot of useful systems have been built. Um, and one of the possible reasons is when we look for the optimization part, it's, um, it's a, very, a lot of good and globally optimum uh, solvers which are globally optimal. Okay, let's move on to with, uh, with um, higher or eight connected pairwise MRFs. So we've seen the knock-on effect in good systems, but what is missing? Um, so we'll go through four possible applications where highly connected MRFs have been used. Uh, modeling real-world textures, um, uh, reducing discretization artifact, or um, that will be in stereo, encoding complex prior knowledge, or using non-local parameters. Okay, so this one here is more of a, um, a simpler toy one, to us, just to illustrate the effect of using higher connectivity. So, <coughs> This one here is a, a certain set of training images. This one is a test image with a lot of noise on. This is the best result. You can choose if you have a four connected pairwise MRF with some unary. So the unary says if it's black, it's more likely black in the test image. If it's white, more likely white. Um, and then 
you really try to learn, I haven't done proper learning here, but I really, I think it's uh, close, to be, close to optimal, the weights of these pairwise terms of the four connected, this is what you get. Um, so now if you choose other links, you say, well, why, why the four neighbors? You could also choose a bit four longer range ones, you get such a result here, which is already visually more pleasing. But if you get um, higher connectivity, and this is the best I could achieve, like this was a nine connected, you get, you get such a result here, which is, which is better. Still, it's not pleasing. I will come when it comes to actually higher order MRFs, I will show much better result here. So interesting, these were nine connections where seven of them were attractive, meaning you prefer the same labeling, and two were repulsive. You say, well, actually, at that distance, I prefer a different labeling. So that's quite uh, something also quite important, discretization artifacts or metrication artifacts, which are discussed quite a lot, especially with variational methods, what Andrew, Andrew Fitzgibbon will talk about. Um, so here, um, let's assume this is part of a segmentation, like it goes here and it either goes the blue line around or it goes this yellow line. Obviously, um, so first of all, the, the, the yellow line has got a length of uh, 5.65. Uh, and this is 8, where 1 is a, is a unit square is 1 here. So obviously such a segmentation would be not possible, so we have to follow the pixel grid, right? Um, so can somebody say with a 4 connected MRF, what would be the, which, la which, which, uh, uh, which uh, 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 segmentation would be longer, this one here or the, or the dark yellow one with a 4 connected MRF? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you're very quick. It's the same because, because if we count the links, it's like these one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's exactly the same thing. Independent of how we choose the weights, it's always like the same length. <coughs> now if you have eight connected, the high, more highly connected, you can actually show that you can really encode the true Euclidean length of the the thing. And there is some nice work by, uh, by Yuri Boykov and, and, and uh, Vladimir Komogorov, and they have really shown that, uh, that you can get to the true Euclidean length. Uh, but to be honest, like for most, for, for problems where you've got data observation, where you have, um, where you have some, I come to that in a second, it's, it's, there are problems to overcome this. But anyway, so let's first look at four connected. This is a result of segmentation with pure four connected. And you get these kind of called Man uh, Manhattan artifacts where there's some straight corners because we cannot distinguish between straight corner and a, nice, a nicer segmentation. Um, and this is eight connected and you kind of see a bit of rounding off here. But then as I, as I just uh, hinted to, there is the, like if we make it contrast sensitive, you anyway get much nicer results and if it's four or eight connected, it's fine. So it's like if it, if it's as long as it's depending on the data, you actually can you don't see these metrication or these artifacts really. Um, that's different, and that's quite a lot of work people do in the variational domain when they talk about um, um, like uh, like uh, 3D reconstruction, where there's no underlying data really. So for so in the in the images, every pixel you've got an observation. In 3D reconstruction, you sometimes have some observations in here from data, but might be very sparse, or you might just only have a silhouette, and you want to construct a full 3D volume. There, you really need even in a 26 connected grid, and it was done work by Daniel Kramer's done 26 connected grid. You still see some implication artifacts quite quite horribly, but this is all if you don't have any data. And a lot of applications, connect and so on, you have got data and you rarely see these, these artifacts, I think. Um, okay, let's come to one uh, encoding complex knowledge. Um, so here again, this is the it's called Tsukuba head, um, where we now want to get better results by thinking about occlusion. Um, so in the real world, you can see sometimes objects moving behind other objects, they are occluded and we haven't thought about that in our simple four connected uh, problem. Um, so here the idea is actually to label both images um, with these uh, 1 to D with the labeling, so both images. Additionally to a standard four connected we also have these long range links linking all every pixel here to all the pixels with our potential matches. Okay? And these links here have a very particular form. They are of the form here that um, that if I have this, this one pixel here and the other pixel here, these label, this any, like a, and you choose any potential labeling here, it's either infinite or zero cost or a cost which I pay for a match when they really, um, yeah, so it's called match cost when I have this unary cost which I pay. 
And this is a very, very particular structure and explain now why such a structure arises from occlusion reasoning. So, so first of all, you might have the scenario that you see with the two with the two left and right view, this is a top view, you see really the same object, like at a certain depth, let's say 10, if you have the same depth, then you, um, you pay this cost because it's on the same surface, you pay this matching cost. You can also have this, this blocking here, so this, there's an object in front of it, and if it blocks, then you don't pay any cost, and you would pay this matching cost for some other pixel here, which we really have that matching here, right? So that's fine, it's correct, zero cost. But what you cannot have is that one image sees this here, but the other one sees further away, because that would look through the object, right? And so this is an infinite cost. You cannot see through objects. So this is a very, very special structure, but and it's a, it's a much more complex, highly connected MRF. And a bit later on, when I come to the comparison, you see that this is much harder to optimize than a standard for connected. Um, and you see that now the results with, with occlusion reasoning are are uh, uh, much nicer now. They've got this here is with occlusion reasoning and versus this is without occlusion reasoning. Okay, um, now let me come to like non-local parameters. So this was, uh, this was what I showed before with the brush strokes here. There's actually, if you, if you, <coughs> if you say that an object should have um, a certain color model and the background might also have a compact color model. We currently, we, before we got it from the brush strokes, but we might want to get it directly from the, from the objects. We should say the, all the foreground pixel have a color model and all the background pixel have a color model. Let's try to find a segmentation so that these color models are as compact as possible. Like for instance, extreme one is just a red pixel is, here, is one distribution and all of the others are another. Then, then all of the other pixels are pretty broad distribution, not very compact. And the compact distribution is preferred compared to wider one, which is automatically if you write down the probabilities. So, um, right, so actually that's, uh, that's something I, I've done like, like uh, now seven years, seven years back where you just draw a rectangle and Andrew actually showed that and let me give you a quick demo of it, uh, how this works. So, um, right, so I've got the image. It's a bit funny shape, right? Anyway, so you click here, this is the, the background removal tool in Office. So when you click here, you get a rectangle, which is um, at a default position, and so you have to move it into a bit more um, sensible position here. So here, okay. I can cut it and paste it here. And, uh, right. Yeah, right, so you, uh, yeah, meeting with the queen. Right, so what's the underlying uh, uh, theory here? And this is actually, there's a lot of approximation going on in the background because it has to be fast. But what's really underlying in the background is we have, we have a color model, we have a global variable called uh, W here, which is really exactly this Gaussian mixture model for foreground and background. And we try to optimize jointly these, these, color, these, these Gaussian mixture model for background and, and foreground and they impact the whole uh, segmentation. So, so we prefer, um, once we have this one here, it's actually getting unary term. If you think of this one being shaded, observed, then it's getting unary term. This is actually, later on I will explain how to optimize it, how it's optimized, but in general, I like, it's a very hard optimization problem because you've got these, these highly connected uh, uh, MRF. And this was actually uh, also used for um, an object recognition segmentation system. So that was a uh, Texon boost we had a while back, um, where exactly there you have got, let's say, k different objects. It could be tree and grass and building and sky. Um, now you want to segment out fully automatically segment that. You have these color models, which are exactly as I explained, so that all the white is more likely house and all the, all the blue is more likely sky. Um, you have a location term here. And the location term can be, for instance, that sky is more likely at the top and grass more likely at the bottom. This is a unary term. You have another class unary term, which, sim which comes from, uh, um, you have to read the paper for the details, but some kind of boosting of features. So you have features which look at uh, surrounding, at rectangles, and at a certain um, uh, texton. 
has like a certain uh, how, how textured it is and it's boosting of these kind of classifiers. You could also use random forest or other classifiers um, here. So this is a unary term and then there is a pairwise term which is also edge, edge sensitive. And here's an example uh, for instance for, for cow detection. So this is the image here with the cow. This is what the class and location gives you. So it roughly nails the cow. Um, when you add edge sensitivity you get much, you get a nicer segmentation. Um, when you add color, it simply says, well, okay, all of the black should be cow, and then you get, a, you get the nice, uh, nice segmentation. Um, there are many, many systems uh, these days, which I don't want to go in, in, in detail, which have got such a, such a structure where there are the observed variable Z, there, are, um, there is a grid of pixels, for instance, which are latent variables, which could be called parts. For instance, this is from the layout CRF from uh, Win and Schotten. Um, where they have used, uh, where they have split the, uh, like a car into different parts and they learned random forest to say what each part might look like as a unary um, and then they have connections to say that neighboring pixels should transition within the same parts or might transition between, um, it's actually a directed field, might be neighboring part or, or up or down part and um, so now there's an MRF on the, or there's a connectivity on the parts they have another layer where they say this is the instance label, so all of the parts go together then form an instance and you get a number of instances um, you can get out. <coughs> and then they have got some global variables which really describe is what is the orientation of the car, which way in 3D even could it be, what is, which way is it facing, what's the size and so on. As in Kinect you can think about what's the height of a person and, and so on, is it like what's it fa female or, fail or male, you can have these, uh, these kind of global variables up here. So these are quite uh, complex models, a lot of people have done in the, in the, um, uh, recently. Um, most of the people, because we talked a bit about marginalization before, um, uh, maximize over all the variables. So when we compute map, we maximize over all of these variables. But you could also think about marginalizing out some of them. You could say you, you really want to marginalize out with respect to all of the, um, all of the, of the variable T. But typically people do maximization and that's still feasible, I mean it's still possible to in such networks. Um, okay, so um, um, we talked about um, highly connected, now um, higher order random fields where there's really um, um, a factor which, which talks to all of the variables. Um, so, for in general, I mean the higher order factors cannot be, in general, and there are special cases obviously, cannot, cannot be decomposed into pairwise. Um, so there are several reasons for doing, using higher order and I will explain only some of them quite briefly. Um, so that is we get um, even better I images or texture model, there's like a field of expert and or curvature we can model. Um, then we can have global priors which really act on the whole image like connectivity or better encoding label statistics or um, converting global variables to global factors which is also quite interesting. So let's just look briefly at some of them. <coughs> I had these, uh, these, these texture images before where I think this was the best result with a nine connected. So we, recent work we've done and you should have to read the paper to get the details but the idea is that um, we have higher order potentials of, of that size here. So these are, these are patches um, of the size, I don't know, 9 by 9. And what you simply say is that these factors, um, you prefer to choose them, but you don't have to choose them. So there's a factor which says that um, either take these three, or they're, they're in total, I think, 20 or so, take these 20, or take an arbitrary labeling with a higher cost. So these ones have got a low cost or you take an arbitrary higher labeling with a higher cost. And then you get such results here which is, um, which is kind of, it's pasting together these patches here but it's using them in a soft way so you don't have to use these patches. If you were to regularly use them, I, I have the image but I, haven't, I forgot to put it in here, if you're really forced to use it you will not get such a nice result. You really have to use it at some place in a soft way. Um, so this is an example of a higher order uh, random field, but the, uh, I mean, I have to say the optimization gets harder and harder when you come to higher order random fields. 
Um, so this one here is a global prior. We've done some work on connectivity. For instance, the user has done a scribbled here and scribbled here as well. And now he's got this segmentation. And now he says, well, I really want to have these, uh, these parts here and this part connected. So I want to have a segmentation which is connected. Then we can get uh, such a result out by just saying it has to be connected you get a really nice result, which would be um, very, very hard with doing um, these brushes and really segmenting it completely. And it's very simple to write it, but then it's obviously complex to optimize. Um, but I will explain how it can be done. Um, and it's very simple to say, well, it's infinite penalty if it's not for connected, the segmentation. And otherwise, it's, if it's for connected, it's, it's no penalty. OK, so this one is a recent work we've done on, on a global prior on the on the label statistics um, <coughs> as I said before is the um, the most trivial labeling which is all black or white is still more likely than this here and that can still influence uh, the the results so here is a here's a again like denoising where um, this is the task here the ground truth and this is the noisy these are results with with such a truncated uh, linear function and we've increased the weight of that of that pairwise term, and it's get more blocky. Um, and this is the this is the intermediate results we get. Sometimes less blocky, and sometimes some more blocky. Depends what you want to have. But <coughs> it's now interesting to look at the statistics. So this is statistic of gradient. So here we take all of the the pairwise and look at what is there. How often does it occur? And that goes back to your question before, where you said why actually um, was it like the other way around the potential? Because there are there are not so many, but still there are some uh, occurrences of these uh, gradients which are, which are uh, with, with high values. But, but probably before we looked at this range where it really never occurs. But still, this is the distribution of the gradients. And we look at these results here, and you look at the gradient statistics, they are far away from the statistics, right? There, is, um, there might be the peak of this here might be similar to this one, but then the distribution goes down and makes this dip here, which is not natural. And then if you try to push that up here with such a result, it's, uh, it's getting more like this shape here, but it's just completely wrong. It's far too peaked here, right? And so what we've done here is like, for instance, you could have a global factor which simply says, well, what I want to have is a result which follows that distribution. So what we've done here is a work which um, which is mainly on the optimization side, we show that it's possible actually, there is a thing, a black line here, which, which uh, is, the result, is the result of this image, the statistics, and it, or the, the red line, and it follows much more this line here compared to the best one of this one. So it's really forcing this, uh, this statistic. Okay, so these are all useful models. How do we optimize them? And this will be uh, the second part. Um, I think I've got... Uh, 15 more. 35 minutes. Uh, 35 minutes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK. Um, so um, <coughs> before we go into that, let's have. Um, so this here is like, a, like an example of a quite advanced uh, conditional random field we've done uh, for a Sikroff paper. Um, so it's called the unwrapped mosaic. Um, <coughs> So here, this is a person uh, talking. Um, and what we've solved is um, we've solved a lot of problems, but it's using a lot of conditional random fields underlying. So you see here the moustache appearing. Oh, stop. Right. So you see the moustache appearing and disappearing, right? Um, so you've seen a second how it's done. So what we've done here and this here is we use the, the head and we kind of unwrap it as one surface. So we, we take, we're trying to have this ear being on this side and hopefully when the video continues. Uh, I don't know what's happening. Right, so this is the whole unwrapping of the, of the face. And once you have that, you, can, you just have one, one, uh, uh, one uh, image where you can do painting on. What's happening here? Uh, we can paint on moustache and eyebrows. And then we've got the full registration of this image here where it would link back in the video. And this is just to...
to highlight the uh, the edits. So there's a full registration of the of the video with this with this with this mosaic, and it solves a lot of optic flow and embedding of the of the surface onto into the video, and it's a lot of a um, lot of different energies to optimize. Um, okay, so before we come to optimization, let's make a small detour to um, continuous variables and continuous domain. Um, so Gaussian MRFs or continuous valued MRFs are quite uh, quite popular, though actually not so many people have worked uh, with, with these models and I think actually deserves a bit more um, attention because they might be quite powerful. Um, so here is, um, here is an energy with um, where it's again a unary and pairwise term where now the, the xi is a continuous variable r. Okay, and um, so here for instance we have, uh, we have um, potentials where the pairwise term and the, un the unary term and the pairwise terms are of a Gaussian form. Or in general, if they're of any convex form, you can get um, during optimization the global optimum. And typically for optimization, people use gradient descent or some other schemes, and I will not discuss any of that. But um, it's quite interesting. With the continuous models, either people stay with Gaussians, a lot of people stay with Gaussians. If you go beyond, outside Gaussian, everything gets much, much harder. Um, but with Gaussians, actually, it is, is still, still is everything is tractable, uh, learning, and, and also uh, the, the inference because of, because of convex, there's only one global minimum. Um, so here's a result which is not uh, so impressive. So it's like in painting, and if you just use these energies, the result doesn't look that great, but it's just to show that if you were to use discrete labels with 255, with TRWS technique, which I'll come to later, um, you get this result. And if you use um, um, just a continuous solver, um, it's called hierarchical basis function. It's like it gets the same result as, as to be expected. It's the same minimum, but it's like 15 times faster. So one message is to take if you have en energies which are of a form of Gaussian, um, then it's actually um, there are much much faster solvers here available and um, give you good results. There is like one interesting work called the field of experts, which is a higher order. Um, random field and it's uh, of continuous variables and this is no longer convex and they had really quite hard time during both learning and, and optimization. So this is, um, this I don't want to go to much detail but this is like here, this X is the, is the labeling here. Um, you, you have a, you do convolve with, with a filter here, J, and these are possible filters and these were learned during the, um, during the learning procedure. These filters are learned, the weights of these filters are learned. Um, and these are linear filters, linearly combined with this one here. Now it's, then it goes through um, a non-convex uh, function here um, with some weights. And then you basically sum over at every position here, every pixel you've got such a patch. So it's a sum of all of these, um, so all of the filters here first of all, and then at all of the pixel positions you've got one of these filters. So it's a very highly overlapping uh, 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 filters which are, which are then due, due to this function here non-convex um, but they get much better results than the standard smoothing which I've just shown like for instance here they've done, they've done uh, this image where they put some text on what you want to in-paint um, they use gradient descent during I think yeah, uh, during, during optimization so this is the field of expert result which really nicely paints that in here where this is the result with just the smoothing MRF. So you clearly see this is a pretty um, much, much better result. So this was here quite important work on the field of experts to show that, that um, higher order random fields are, are useful and they've done a nice comparison between uh, uh, 3 by 3 filters, 5 by 5, 8 by 8 um, and so on. Um, well actually they stopped with 8 by 8. 8 by 8 are actually not performing much better than I think 7, uh, seven by 7 would not perform much better, not 9 by 9 would not perform much better than 7 by 7. So, um, so just uh, this is a hint and Andrew Fitzgibbon will go in a, in a lot of detail about uh, continuous domain methods. So what's continuous domain? And there's actually a very nice paper which I encourage to read by, by, by Stefan Roth at, Roth at the CVPR which connects <coughs> discrete uh, discrete domain uh, models um, um, or objective functions with uh, continuous domain ones, right? So, um, <clears throat> so in continuous domain, let's assume this is the this is the input image. This is just like a very zoomed in on the pixels. So these are the individual pixels here. You think about this whole area here as a continuous um, as a continuous function. 
So one way to, for instance, um, model this function is using finite elements and one of the most simple things is to say, well, let's first use a triangulation um, as the underlying basis. So, um, but they have, in this work, they have done it with a lot of different uh, variations of this one here. But, um, so for instance, you could think about um, at all of these points here where the triangles meet, you have at all of these vertices, as the blue ones here, you have um, a, um, an arbitrary uh, continuous label. And in this way, you can think about all of these triangles being, being um, slanted surfaces in line of 3D. And this gives you a continuous domain uh, function out. So you can choose all of these blue pixels, you can choose a different continuous value. So this gives you a certain families of, of continuous functions. And then what they have shown is actually if you have the standard called um, total variation term where there's some, some uh, uh, convex data term for instance which comes from the unary um, convolved with this image also sometimes in discrete, sometimes continuous. They have done also this one, the data term continuous. And then this total variation is very similar to um, to a, the standard pairwise smoothness term which we had. So it simply says the, um, the, uh, the first derivative you want to penalize. And it's just a linear norm on the first derivative, this the total variation. Then you can actually show that you can write exactly this thing here if you have this basis function as a triple click M ref, for instance. So this is, uh, uh, you've got all these nodes here which take some continuous variables and these ones here are triple cliques. And this here does exactly the same thing as this here. And they've looked at a lot of different ways of how to, how to write this um, with different finite elements and how to write the discrete one and then compared solvers and looked like what, uh, what are the pros and cons. And, and just for me a bit of the summary with this discrete continuous is, is um, the advantage of the continuous are that, um, that it's independent of the pixel grid. That's the whole idea that kind of people say that the world is continuous, why should I start to use pixels as my, as my, uh, as my labeling? Um, and they are very fast, for, for these quite simple energies, they are very fast uh, GPU solvers which do convex relaxation and very fastly uh, solve it. So that's the positive things. I think one dis some of the disadvantages are that, that if one talks about the continuous world, one really has to think about camera point spread function other effects because otherwise there's a lot happening until you get to the pixel grid. And you, if you talk about the continuous world, you also have to model these things which is rarely done of or rarely seen with, with these um, continuous approaches. Um, they can so far, now there's interpretation with discrete models, but so far there's no probabilistic explanation. There's no learning involved yet in, uh, in these uh, continuous domain models. And also the variational models are um, rather simple in the sense they take first or second order derivatives, but like compared, like in that work, they compared to the field of expert result, which is just like a highly connected grid, which would be, I don't know what it means in continuous domain, but would be quite different, might be a very highly connected whatever in the continuous domain, hard to say what it is, but it it's, uh, outperforms the continuous methods. So um, I think there is like, um, if you go to the level of really trying to model a point spread function, really trying to model the world, it's worth to think about continuous domain methods, but otherwise, I think the uh, 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 discrete is, is fine. Um, apart from these, they have got pretty good solvers for some of the, where, it's only one, where there's a global minimum uh, convex problems, they have very fast solvers, which might also be interesting to look for this, in the discrete domain. Um, okay, so um, any question to the part I've shown? Otherwise, I step into optimization techniques. <coughs> Right? Good. All right. That's a question. Sorry. Mm. No, no, far away from real time. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I think it takes several hours to compute, uh, to compute the full registration, everything. Um, once you have the registration, it's real time obviously the editing, right? Because you have the whole mapping of the surface, of the unwrapped surface to the, to the video. Um, and then you just can paint on it and in real time you can play it back and edit it, right? But this registration is a very complex thing and there are also sometimes user interactions needed to really get it a good, a good um, I don't know exactly. I, uh, uh, I was not in, uh, I, yeah, Pushmit Kohli mainly did, did that and I think they read several hours to get, uh, to get a good a good registration, yeah.
Okay, um, optimization techniques. Um, let me start by motivate why, why uh, optimization or good optimization is important. Um, so here is an example from, um, from an image sequence where you want to compute an intermediate frame. So you might have an, a video camera which moves like a bit down and you, and you see or like it moves up and the object moves down um, and now you want to compute an intermediate frame. And for this one there is one, one approach which, um, which um, and Fritz Given and others have done where they convert that to, into a pairwise Markov random field which actually is a binary with each pixel you, you know they're either there's one or the other color and you just have to decide which color you want and they use some patch space MRF to get uh, some patch space method to get to that to get MRF and so they uh, so actually Oli Woodford a student of um, and Fritz Given asked me to optimize that and was was quite interesting to look into the um, into some of the results. So let's zoom into this, into this area here. Um, so this is the ground truth um, and this is, the, uh, this is the results with different methods and they're all um, not globally optimal. Um, and so this is graph cut um, and I will come later to it but, but it's, uh, this was an energy which is, cannot be optimized with graph cut. So we had some, uh, there was some truncation needed and so there's an approximation and you see here this is not nice that it gets this year and this year. Uh, belief propagation get this result and I will explain what belief propagation is and but you see here this part here is, is missing out down here um, and that was slightly better I think in here and this is simulated annealing yet another technique. Um, so now we had, uh, we, had uh, we looked at it and that was done with, uh, with Viktor Lempitsky and others. We looked at um, extension of a certain technique we, we called QBBOP and it just happened that for this one, I mean for other parts of the image it might be very similar these techniques but if you looked on this part here it happens to be that we get the global optimum and we suddenly see the result look actually much, uh, much nicer. And this is really very often when you, when you start to develop very fancy models you run some optimization then you say well it doesn't really work so what do you work on? Do you work on the model or the optimization and it's just it, it always you have to keep that in mind that it's, 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 it's quite good to look at alternative optimization techniques. There are for instance very simple ones such as uh, simulated dealing which are not very expensive to, to run and to test and it's always worth to test that because we have sometimes actually been surprised I will show later results where we run simulated annealing and actually they got extremely good results which you wouldn't expect uh, beforehand because there have been a lot of papers in the last 10 years to say well we really worked hard on these kind of combinatorial optimization methods. So it's just worth to look around at different optimizations and to spend a bit time to, to see that before you jump into um, uh, uh, improving your model. Um, obviously you see now it's also good if you get this global optimum you know at least the global optimum doesn't have some of the highlights here. I mean probably it's a bit hard to see because the sun comes in but there are some there are some highlights here like this here this year which is not here it's smoothed out so so you might want to represent some more highlights to get a visually more appealing result. Okay so recap uh, this is how we write um, um, our energy for the optimization part so it's there is um, there are some unary terms there are some uh, some pairwise terms here um, this is uh, um, sum over uh, sum of the pixels xi, this is, these are the pairwise terms and there might be uh, um, some high order terms here which depends then on multiple, multiple variables. Okay and the label space can be um, either uh, a binary, uh, binary label space 0, 1 or multi-label 0, 2, 0, 2, k. Okay. So this is the uh, big picture and I've got another slide with, with all the possible inference methods and I will try to cover quite a lot to give you the flavor of all of these methods, what's going on in the background. I will go into very detail of some of them, I explain graph cut for instance in detail uh, but for some of them I only a bit scratch on the surface um, that you get an idea what's, what's, what, what they're doing. Um, so they're combinatorial optimization methods and that will be the main part. What I talk about, there are so-called um, dual or problem decomposition techniques, there are local search techniques or genetic algorithms, um, there are message passing algorithms and I will go into uh, some more details here as well and some of the details of, of LP relaxation techniques. Um, and um, yeah, so these are the, uh, these are the kind of uh, five different uh, categories of, of, of methods. Um, this, these are all for discrete, discrete uh, labelings. 
Um, and that's just uh, on, the, on the big picture, um, <coughs> if you have like these higher order uh, potentials, they are, <coughs> they are tractable up to, um, up to a certain size, like up to, um, up to order of um, probably six, it's, it's possible to actually for arbitrary potentials to optimize them and there are either message passing techniques or um, over combinatorial optimization techniques but they get just very uh, uh, like uh, both a certain size if they are arbitrary potential it's just very very hard to optimize uh, memory and, and, and computation time. Uh, both, uh, both this kind of like uh, six or seven um, it's still there are quite a lot of interesting potentials but they all have um, certain special structure and uh, we'll come to that then what, what what structure is, is good to, um, which are still tractable to do, uh, to do inference. Okay, so function minimization is, uh, that's a very big uh, part of like, I mean, all optimization community. Uh, two, op two very important questions are which functions are exactly solvable and um, approximate solution of NP-hard uh, uh, problems. And you just, I mean, I just list here some of the researchers from the, from the vision community which have worked on these problems and there are a lot and a lot of papers appearing on, on discrete optimization. Um, although I think on other domains, like as I said, continuous labelings could also, there could be even also uh, some more work, but people concentrated in recent years quite a lot on these discrete problems. Um, okay, let's start with, uh, with one uh, uh, particular one which is um, message passing and I will explain um, the following method uh, which is dynamic programming or message passing on a chain um, and then I will go on to trees and then we can see what, how, how loopy graphs are done or graphs with, with loops in them. Um, just give me a short break. So, um, so let's assume we have the following um, energy where there is, um, where there, we've got only three nodes, P, Q and R. And we have some, um, we have some unaries on, on, the, on the P label, on uh, XP, and can actually have three labels, uh, you see in a second, and there are three different unaries. Um, there could be, a, I don't have that I think here, for Q and R it could also be unaries. And then you've got pairwise terms for, for these P and Q and Q and R and um, they are of the form if they are the same we don't uh, pay anything but if they are different we pay a cost of two. Okay so the question is now for this chain here and um, I will show here these are the, um, the unary terms so the, if it's P is in state there are three states one, two and three let's say um, it's, it, the unary costs are five, one and two. So the question, how, how can you write an efficient algorithm to find the global optimal labeling of that? So you want each of these pixels got three possible labels. We've got this energy here with, with the unary term and you might have some unary terms here as well and, and pairwise terms. How can we find officially the global optimal? And this is called dynamic programming it's, and it's very simple. Um, so we compute so-called messages. Um, a message is the information which is passed on up to node Q and encodes all of the things we have up to node Q, all of the unary and pairwise terms. So <coughs> what we do is we take, we, we has a message has got uh, three values and we say the first value says what is uh, for this pixel Q, if it were to be in state L, in state L1, the first state, um, what, would be, what would be the um, optimal configuration for these ones here? So we say okay if it's this L1 and it were to be this one here, P would have, uh, would have been um, also in state L1, what is the cost? We have a 5 plus 0 because the pairwise cost here is 0, it has the same label, so 5 plus 0, okay? Now it could be in this, in this state here which is 1, um, so we've got a unary cost of 1 and a pairwise of 2 because it's different, okay? So it's 1 plus 2 and this here is 2 and it's also different so it's 2 plus 2. Okay, so we take the minimum of these, which is, which is in this case, it's three, it's the middle one. So we mark, we mark that link here as being the optimal one, as the optimal link, and we also know it's the label of this is three. Okay, so now we can go do the same thing for L2 and L3, and this is then, this is then the message which we which we compute up to node Q and codes everything. So we have got three one two as the as the labeling here. 
And just to confirm, the one is from this link here, which is, um, which is yes. So this is the unary one, and we pay zero cost. And this is, the, uh, this is a two here, and we pay zero cost. OK? Um, so this is the message up to, up to label, uh, up to Q. OK, so now we compute the message up to, um, up to node R. And how we do that is we take all of the information in here. So we have the information up to here. And now we encode that information coming in here, the message coming in here, the node Q, the unary here, and the pairwise term here as well. We take all of that together and compute, and that computes the new message up to node R. OK, so assume here we go again through all of these, these labels here, and now it would be such a connection here. So if I take this one here, I would go here. If I, if I take this one, I would go here. If I take this one, I would, would take this as the optimum one. And now we can simply read out the optimum, because we have got the message up to here. We've got also the unary at this place here. So we've got F is the unary at this place. The message up from, from, uh, from, uh, kind of, yeah, from, from Q to R, exactly, from up to here. Um, and just take the minimum of these two, and this gives us, and it might be this label here, gives us the global minimum, first of all, in terms of value. Um, and then we can trace that back the path, and we know this is the optimal one, so we just trace it back here. So this is the path, and this is the uh, uh, global optimum of the, whole, of the whole thing. And it's just, you think about it, we just carry down all of the unary and pairwise terms in a sensible way, computed all the messages. Um, so we can, we can have a forward, forward pass and a backward pass. And, um, and then this gives us the global optimum. You can actually state instead of, um, this is now the, the, uh, the global optimal solution, you can also take marginals. Then you have instead of, um, instead of taking max here or min here, you take a sum. And that's called then later on when it's BP, it's like instead of um, there's max product BP and some product BP, which sometimes com some product BP does the marginals and the other one does the, does the map solution or the global optimum. So we see here this is optimal for a, for a chain. Um, so it's global optimum in linear time. So now for a tree, um, we can start with a, with a leaf, uh, <coughs> leaf P here, um, Q and R, and this is another leaf S, and this is the root. Um, we can get, again, with, uh, with, um, with dynamic programming, we get the global optimum. So we've got an inward and outward pass. So in the inward pass, we first compute a message from P to Q, then from Q to R, which in this case I indicate takes all of the information up to, up to this point here. There's another message from S to R, um, and now there is a big message which, which takes the incoming message here, the incoming message here, the unary term, and this pairwise term, and then computes the new message. And that's up to this node here. Now with this message here, um, sorry, with this message here and the unary, we can compute the optimum, and then we can trace it back as we've done before with the links, and this gives you for, um, for a tree the, the optimal uh, solution. Okay? Now, um, yeah, so now people have thought, okay, it works on trees. Let, what what do, shall we do if we have loops in the graph? And people just said, well, let's, let's just apply the same algorithm, really, and just update these messages until um, certain, certain number of iterations. And um, there is a lot of theory behind different update schemes, and I, I'm not an expert on these kind of things. I, I, I don't want to go into so many details, but the... Um, but there are different schedules. There is a sequential schedule and a parallel schedule. It's about how do you initialize these messages. Um, but again, there are just like you look at the incoming messages, at the node here, at the pairwise term, compute compute the outgoing message. And then you simply, you can do this message, and then you can do this one, this one, this one. You can do it sequential fashion, or you do a parallel all the messages. Um, and there are different, um, there's quite a lot of theory around, around that as well, what, what, uh, what works better than other things. Um, one important speed up trick for these message passing is if you have certain potentials, like if you have a, a POTS model for the pairwise term, um, or we, we had before a truncated linear, so remember these pairwise term, which is like, like, a, like a form like this here, um, then, <coughs> then you can compute these messages in, um, in, uh, in linear time compared to quadratic. So before what I explained was I had to go through, in order to compute the message, I had to go for all of these nodes here, and for each one, I have to take the minimum with respect to this one. 
And this is a technique which automatically there is some convolution with, with uh, going on and they managed to get it in, o, in, in K where you just have to go linearly through ones of these labels to get automatically the optimal message out without going through all of these ones. And that's a quite nice uh, technical contribution which also is very important for speed. If you use these packages um, like, um, <clears throat> like Vladimir Komokrov has done a very nice package of different variations of these message passing. Um, there you, um, if you have certain potentials, then you can, it's automatically doing uh, the messages in a faster way, which is, which is important. Yeah, exactly. That's a generalized distance transform, yeah. Yeah. Um. So then uh, uh, TRW is also an, an another variant of, of, of message passing, and I will explain it in a bit more detail later when we come to problem decomposition, but um, so it's called a tree reweighted message passing. So it's, um, it goes in the following way. You have your graph here and you split it into trees. And now um, the trees can be done. So the, the whole idea is like the, the main question is how do you split it into trees? And I will explain that in a, in a, in a later section. How do you then op optimally, um, well, the, the trees are always fixed, like what exactly structure of the trees you choose. But what are exactly the, the variables here you choose for the unary and pairwise terms? That's, that, has to be, um, that has to be determined and we'll come a bit later to that. But you can think about these, for instance, unary terms could be split evenly up into these trees. So if this is like a certain unary factor, could be half of it here and half of it here. And there's a pairwise factor could half of here and, and or like half here and half here. And now what you do is you have um, <coughs> you do, you find the global optimum on the tree, and we've just explained how to do that. When we find the global optimum, there's something called node averaging, where you take all of the solutions of these individual trees, you average them, and get a new, and get a, a new solution. And then with this new solution, you actually again invoke new, um, a new problem here, a new splitting problem, and then you optimize again the trees. And this will come a bit clearer when I come to the problem decomposition of, of one way of doing this here, this splitting, which is actually the optimal way of doing it. Um, and this one here, there are very, various ways of how to do this, uh, do these unary and pairwise terms, and these are then variants of this kind of TRW, um, tree reweighted message passing. Um, it also provides you a bound, and I will come to that later when it comes to problem decomposition, why it provides a bound. Um, and is also related um, to LP relaxation, which, which, um, um, which I will not go into much detail why, why this is actually related to LP relaxation. It's like it performs some reparameterization, which is then you can see as some solving some underlying LP problem. So, <coughs> to summarize, um, so message passing, it's, um, it's exact on trees. Um, or like, like chains, you can might have some like model here where there is, um, there is uh, like a person, a person model or for faces and so on. And this is actually, yeah, this is uh, um, also quite similar. What you can think about as being used in Kinect, right? You might have some, some observation here and you try, then try to find the optimal layout of the body parts, right? And this is simply using a dynamic programming because it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tree in the end. Um, so for loopy graphs, there are many different techniques, BP, TRW, um, dual decomposition and diffusion, um, and they're different in terms of um, the update rules, and, um, and you can either compute map or marginals if you do like, um, if you do the, the minimum or the sum when you do this, when you compute the messages, and there are some connections with LP relaxation. And there's also a variant for that for higher order random fields where you actually um, have messages which go from nodes to factors and back from factors to node, and this is uh, uh, this is called factor graph BP, and it's quite uh, it's not very often used actually in computer vision, but in machine learning uh, people have uh, used that. Um, so for the details here, there are some uh, recent tutorials uh, we have done which which go into these uh, some of these details. Okay, so now um, that will be then um, I think the uh, second lecture um, on combinatorial optimization. I mean, I can start a bit with it, le let's say the first five minutes, and then we uh, probably should, uh, should stop. Uh, so I will, uh, we'll talk about various different problems. So there's um, binary pairwise, uh, multi-label and pairwise, um, and binary in higher order, and, um, 
and different, uh, 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 different techniques, either transformation techniques or roof making techniques. You just have to see, um, right. <coughs> I might, uh, I, yeah, I go briefly and I might repeat it in the next uh, lecture again. Um, okay, so if you look at um, binary functions, uh, one important question is which binary function can be solved um, exactly? And um, there's a so-called um, submodularity condition which, is, which, is, uh, which, is, which decides if a function can be um, optimized uh, globally or not. And this is the, uh, this is the condition of the, or the submodularity condition. So, um, so for instance, if we have um, if we have two only two pixels um, or two label uh, uh, two two nodes with, with binary labels, then we look at all of the sets A and B of um, which which compares or it comprises of, of, of two um, two variables. So it can be uh, zero zero one zero zero one or one one, and um, you have to plug it in here the sets A and B and has always to be greater equal than if you do the or at the end operation on these, on these sets. So for instance, um, a lot of these conditions actually, if you plug it in, they're all like, like trivially um, satisfied. For instance, if we plug in, I don't know, we plug in, um, um, let's, say, let's say we plug in um, 0, 0 and 0, 1 for instance. So A is 0, 0 and B is 0, 1 then if you plug that in here, it would be 0, 0 plus 0, 1, greater or equal to um, the OR operation is um, 0, 0 and 0, 1 is 0, 1, and the end operation is 0, 0. So you have got 0, 0, 0, 1, and here is 0, 1, 0, 0. So it's like, it's just, it's equal because they cancel out. So a lot of these, for all of these sets, it's actually, it's all trivially satisfied, apart from the fact when you have got this condition here, which is 1, 0 and 0, 1, has <coughs> to be greater or equal 1, 1, and 0, 0. So this is a very important condition, and if this is satisfied, and we come to that in a second, it's very often satisfied for a lot of vision problems. If this is satisfied, then we can use a technique which I explain in detail called graph cut, where you get the global optimum out for this. Um, so very nice important property is that, um, so I talked about uh, two, uh, two nodes here. Um, that the sum, if you, if you um, so first of all, we can also look just at, at one node, which is 0, 1, and this condition is trivially satisfied. If you have 0 and 1, uh, let's say 0, 0, it would be obviously 0, 0, and this is all 0, 0, but for 0, 1, 0 and 1, it's, um, the OR is, um, is, is 1 and the end is 0, so it's again satisfied. So unaries are automatically satisfied. Now the important property is that if you add up um, Submodular functions, um, they are again submodular. So if you have pairwise terms which are satisfied this year, all of the sum of the pairwise terms and of unary terms are also set as unary terms always satisfied, they are again submodular. So <coughs> for image segmentation, we had kind of such an energy here where we had some, some unary terms and we can also write um, 1 minus x, but this was always the pairwise term. It was, it was always um, a, a difference and an absolute value of the difference of 2. Of two. And um, so if we see here, if we plug in um, 0, 1 and 1, 0, this is here 1. So if you had 1 and 1, it's 2. Greater equal, and this is, if it's the same as 0, so greater equal 0. So it's like as long as the d is positive, this is always satisfied, the submodularity condition. And, and since here is a sum over all these submodular condition, as uh, the submodular uh, terms here, it's also submodular the energy. And we will see in a second, uh, or in the next lecture, that this function can be globally optimized with graph card, with using certain, uh, uh, converting to a, a network flow problem, and um, then this can be solved globally optimal. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, probably stop, uh, stop here. Um, are there any uh, questions? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. uh, yeah, so typically, yeah, yeah you, can, you convert them to, um, to pairwise and um, with auxiliary variables. That's, that's, that's uh, you have to convert them to, uh, to some, to pairwise and, and Yes, it's always possible with exponential number of nodes. I will, um, I will ex in the next lecture I've got some slides on that. So you can do the conversion, 
conversion, and then you have to be yeah you have to be uh, lucky uh, to be uh, submodular or not, um, and we will see some examples. All right, then that's uh, that's it. There are no more questions. I mean, you can come to me if you have any more questions. Okay.